But let's get started. You know, um, Dr. Galloway, I want to thank you for coming on the show and sharing your story with our viewers and our listeners. Could you please briefly tell us what's going on in your life and your K-12 career right now? I appreciate it. And yeah, I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm a brand new superintendent. I actually just started my, my superintendent role in July of last year. And so I moved up to, to Northeast Texas from the San Antonio area. So we're about 30 miles west of Texarkana uh, in Texarkana, Texas. So we're about 30 miles west of Texarkana. And we moved up six and a half hours from San Antonio area to a small rural district. I just finished my 14th year in education. And so I'm new to the superintendent role and we're just trucking along and learning a lot about what it means to be a superintendent in a small rural district. Wow. Thank you so much. So how, how big is your school district? How many students do you have? We have 800 students in, in our district. It's a K-12 district, and we have approximately 1,600 people in, in the town of Decap. So it's a very small rural wow. community. Okay, so half the town goes to school during the day. Yeah, well, our district's pretty large, so it, it encompasses a large area, uh, surface area. So sure. a lot of the, the, the students come from the outside counties. And actually here in this area, there really is not a... Um, uh, boundaries for, for transfers. We, we accept transfers from any district around us. And, okay. you know, they, they come for different reasons, whether the parent works near the area or sure. they're interested in something we offer that one of the other school districts doesn't offer. So there are a lot of transfers up in this area. Cool. Well, Dr. Galloway, that had to be a, a I don't want to say difficult transition, but it had to be a transition for you to go from a, a pretty much urban area in San Antonio to a rural area like where you are now. How was that transition, not only for you and your career, but, you know, for your family? It's definitely been an adjustment period. I, I came from the Midwest, and so I, I lived in a small town that wasn't too much larger than, than the decab uh, city limits or how big the, the decab is. Um, but what, you know, has been the biggest challenge for me is that coming from a large urban area, really, the you, you kind of blend in. You're just another number. And sure. so... Up here in, in DCAB, you know, in a small area, you know, people know when I'm not at church and they'll, they'll send me a message, say, why aren't you at church today? What's going on? Everything OK? Yeah. They, they know pretty much everything that's going on with, with us and our family, which is not a bad thing. I don't mind that at all. You sure. know, there's a lot of transparency in that. Um, it's kind of a checks and balances for you as a superintendent. You know, it's definitely a, a political type role. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're the face of the community. So it really makes you think twice um, anytime you go out to the grocery store and Am I going to put on, you know, a nice shirt and I'm gonna, or am I going to go on my my shorts and my T-shirt because I've been mowing and those type of things? Um, sure, but because, sure. you know, you're going to run into somebody. But I think for for me, I think DCAB is the perfect size for a first time superintendency. Um, it, it's got 800 kids and, you know, I have three principals, um, but I'm getting that full range of experiences where in a large district, you know, the superintendent has a, a completely different role. They have a larger cabinet. It sure. does a lot of the activities where I I'm hands on. I don't even have really an HR department. Okay. Um, you know, I have a person that helps with that, but she's also my PEMS person too. Okay. So when it comes to, you know, like human resources, that's me. I have a budget manager, but we're really hands on working together in those type of things. So it's wow. been, it's been a good experience so far for sure. That's awesome. That's really cool. So now you mentioned that you've only been in education for 14 years. Is this your second career? Yeah, it, it really is. So when, I left high school. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I just knew that I probably didn't want to go to college right away. Sure. So what I did is I joined the military my junior year in high school and okay. I did what they call the split op program. I went to basic training between my junior and senior year. I came back, finished my senior year, and then I went to military police school. At that time, it was the reserve. So, I, you know, that was one weekend a month and two weeks out of the year where I was active uh, with the military. But then I went into working at Blockbuster as an assistant manager. Um, I stayed there for a little bit and I went on to work for La Quinta Hotels. I worked as a operations supervisor for the, the call center at the time okay. uh, for about three years. And when they moved to, to Dallas, uh, you know, I, I lost my job. So I eventually moved into working at 
uh, Hollywood video and as a store manager. Um, so I got that customer service, retail management experience. And then uh, as we all know what happened to Hollywood video. They eventually closed. So um, yeah. I was looking for other options. And I, at the time I had two, two small kids and I thought, you know, I, I hit a glass ceiling and that's something that, you know, you do when you, you don't have an education is you eventually get to a point where you can't go much further. So I actually started working for USAA, which is a, a huge insurance company for yeah. the military. Um, with my military police background, I got a real good job working there in security and I would work nights and weekends. So I only worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but I worked from about 8 PM until 9 AM the next day. Okay. And so I spent my time at nights there working the gates and actually going to school online, um, with American military university. I finished my bachelor's degree, uh, in history. And then I had a choice to make, what do I want to do? So I was yeah. looking at law school, um, and, and I applied to St. Mary's university and was going to go that route. Um, but then I decided, you know, I really had a passion for coaching and social studies. So I decided to go become a teacher and a coach. So I actually taught for a charter school for my first three years. I started the wrestling program there and did very well. Um, okay. But then eventually decided to move into one of the larger independent school districts. So I went over to Judson ISD, which is a very large uh, district in the San Antonio area. And I, I coach wrestling and football and I taught criminal justice um, over in the, the Judson school district. And at one point, my boss at the time, who was a retired military principal, um, he was retired military and he said, you know, we, we would like you to be a sub for us for administrators. We had about six assistant principals and every time there was a assistant principal absent, it kind of created this hole uh, in the administration and they, we had a lot of discipline issues and those type of things, mm -hmm. uh, fights breaking out. And he said, we need more bodies. So he just had me get a sub for my classroom and I went into to that that substitute role. And I enjoyed it a lot. So I decided to pursue a administrative certification um, after going through that role. At the end of that year, after going through that process, I decided to apply for an assistant principal job at our rival campus across the district, Judson High School, which had approximately 3,700 kids at that time. It was a very large school. And I was hired there. And after about three months of working that job, I was sitting in a social studies professional learning communities with our, our team. And my principal was in there at the time. And he heard how I was working with the teachers. And he told me that our academic dean was soon going to be leaving to be a principal. So he asked me if I'd be interested in that role. And, and I said, yes. And so I took that role. Um, and he told me, he said, if you take this role, it's a springboard into the principalship. And it was. It, 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 after two years of being in that role, I, I was an elementary principal in the wow. Justice District. Okay. Um, so I and, and I talked to him. He was my mentor. And I talked to him and I said, you know, I don't know anything about elementary. What do I do? And he said, if you want to be a superintendent one day. And by this point, I'd already started my Ph.D. program. OK. He said, if you want to be a superintendent, he says, you need to go get the elementary experience so you can have that K-12 experience. So I applied and I interviewed. I got the job at the lowest performing campus in the district. It I was the ninth principal in seven years. Um, we had a high poverty rate, high crime rate in our area. Wow. Um, but I stayed there for two years and I really enjoyed that experience. And I got to the end of my courses in my PhD and I had to make a decision. Do I want to to stay in a principalship role, or if I want to become a superintendent, I knew I was going to need to go get some additional experiences in central office and looking at a rural district, because I knew that in Texas, I believe about 75% of the districts are rural. So I knew my wow. first superintendent job probably would be that. So yeah. I started looking around and, and my wife actually found it before I did. She was from a small town called Floresville, uh, which is just south of San Antonio. And she sent me a job posting for a uh, director of secondary teaching and gifted and talented. Well, my master's is in gifted and talented and oh, I was wow. a secondary teacher before. Okay. So this kind of fit, you know, going back home and it just kind of made sense. So I went and interviewed for that job. And even before I got home, I got the call that I got the job. And so I was in that role for just probably about a year and a half before the director of elementary decided to leave. And um, the superintendent there, I, I went to her and asked if I could just be the director of teaching and learning. So that kind of put me in charge of all K-12. Um, and we did a lot of good things there with dual credit. 
and that's when I started to look and, and, and after, after my second year there, I started applying for superintendent jobs. Um, and it was a long journey, um, trying to find a job, but it, it was a good experience that I learned a lot from for sure. Wow. That's an amazing story. First of all, I want to thank you for your service to our military. Um, I'm also a fellow weekend warrior. Um, <laughs> so definitely um, can identify with that. Um, but yeah, that's amazing. I mean, for you to, you know, just jump in with both feet after all of those different experiences in corporate America. And here we are 14 years later and you, you name it, you've done it. Elementary, high school, yeah. you know, uh, teacher, coach, you yeah. know, principal, director of teaching and learning and now superintendent. That's a really amazing journey. And I definitely thank you for um, sharing that. Now, let me ask you a question, because the one thing I think about even in my own career is like, I just didn't jump into, you know, really pursuing a superintendency because of the volatile nature of the position. Sure. Um, what, what advice would you give to people that are, you know, saying, wow, this is amazing what Dr. Galloway is sharing, but I don't know about, you know, um, the stability of a position like that. What would you say to them? Sure. You know, I think that a lot of people and myself included, you know, worry about that. And you hear the horror stories, you know, I've heard horror stories of superintendents that never unpack because they never know how long they're going to be there. Wow. But I think that um, the the key is, is finding a district that's a fit for you mm. and, and, and that, that you are fit for that district. And, you know, for me, I applied to 47 different districts before I even got my first interview. And once I got my first two interviews, I quickly realized that, you know, this is something I wanted to do. And um, I was in the top two for both of those. And I had to make a choice on which which route I was going to go. Uh, I just knew I needed to get in the room somewhere. But it's, it's, it's a difficult process. But what I've heard from multiple mentors and other superintendents is, you know, several times we think that we're not ready. And, you know, you, you've been an administrator yourself. Uh, you were not ready for the role you took on. Neither one of us. You know, my dissertation topic is on that simple fact on preparing principals because I didn't feel like I was prepared to be an assistant principal. I didn't feel like I was prepared to be a principal. And I don't think I was prepared to be a superintendent. But, you know, if you have a calling to be in education and you have a passion to do what's right for kids, then jump on in and take a risk and, and go out there and do it. And you may have to leave you know, your, your comfort zone to do that for yeah. us, our comfort zone was San Antonio area. And I think that was one of the biggest reasons it took so long to find a job was because I was applying for, you know, some of the districts in our area that were, it was a super competitive area. Sure. And so I, I almost had to leave Texas <laughs> up by <laughs> Arkansas and Oklahoma border to get my first job. And yeah. the funny thing is, is, you know, I got discouraged along the way several times thinking, you know, maybe, maybe God's sending me a message. This isn't right for me because I'm not getting looks and I'm not getting interviews. And, but I realized that, no, I just needed to find the right fit. And sure. so once I got this job, I knew that it was the right place to be. You know, I have such a supportive board and um, the community has been amazing to myself and my wife and my family. So, you know, I think I, if I have any advice for anyone is just don't give up and don't be afraid to, to look outside. And, and this is something that I think is important too. And I've heard this from several superintendents that are experienced and veterans. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to just go get the experience and sometimes you have to take a pay cut to do so. And okay. so, you know, I was looking for districts that were pretty big from anywhere from 1200 to 4,000, which doesn't seem that big, but when you consider that over 500 districts in, or over half the districts in Texas are 500 or less, then wow. those are pretty good sized districts. Wow. And, and I wasn't getting the looks because they were looking for people with superintendent experience. Okay. And, and I took a, a pretty good pay cut coming up here. Uh, but then after six months, the, the, the board, you know, took care of me after doing a good job and, and, okay. and I was able to negotiate a higher salary. Um, okay. You know, it's, it's just, sometimes you got to take that pay cut and you got to go get that experience. So that's awesome. So, I mean, what about the stability part? Did they take care of you? I mean, do you have a two-year contract, four-year contract? Yeah. How does that work? So I had an, a three-year contract initially, but after six months, when I got my evaluation, um, I got the raise I was looking for, and I got an, an additional year on my contract. So wow, I have a four-year okay. contract now. Um, so, you know, it's, and in, in, in Texas, you know, you'll see these superintendents that get bought out all the time, um, you know, for whatever reason, sure. um, you know, in Texas, I think if you get bought out, it, it's one year of your, it's one year salary. It's not the full four years. Oh, but, okay. 
but you know, I've heard this before, um, and then I'm sure it's pretty evident across the the United States. But um, you know, once once a superintendent, always a superintendent. Yeah. Because once you've got that experience, um, and once you do a, a pretty decent job, there are going to be sometimes when the school board may not agree with you, or for example, you know, when boards hire you they hire you, but then there's election cycles. And if a new board member comes in, you're not the mm. same superintendent they hired. So they could equally say, you know, you're, you're, we no longer want you anymore and really not have a, a reason for it. You know, it's not because of poor performance, but once you've been a superintendent, you're going to find another job. And um, it's almost like head football coaches, you know, yeah. you can go 0-10 yeah. as a head football coach, but you could get picked up by another school district because you have that head football coach experience. So I would say that if you're passionate about kids and you're willing to take a risk, jump in there, but, but you have to be willing to move. You can't stay in your comfort. That's zone. the key. That's the key. Yeah. I've always looked at it. Like whether we're talking about APs, principals, district level or superintendent, like those are club levels, right? And once you get right. into that club level, and in your case, the superintendent level, you, you're there, right? So it's yeah. a lot easier to move, maneuver around at that level. But I think it's really amazing your persistence. I mean, 47 applications without one interview and you never gave up. That says a lot about you and your persistence. Well, I'll tell you, and in, 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 uh, to, to give you the full story, um, to go a little bit deeper into it, you know, and, and I, I know it was more than 47. It was 47 when I started keeping count. <laughs> when we started, when we started tracking it, it probably was closer to 60, somewhere wow. around there. But, you know, I, at one point, you know, I was, I was applying and nothing was happening and I was getting frustrated. And then my superintendent announced in Floresville that she was retiring. And I thought, okay. And she talked, she called me in and I was the only internal candidate. And I thought, okay, this is a great experience. I'm going to stay here. She said, I really think that you got a great shot, but you know, she said, beware boards are finicky. You never know what they're going to do. And at the time the, the board in Floresville was a little contentious. Um, They were kind of split down the middle and I didn't get an interview and they were looking for someone who actually had superintendent experience and they hired a, a great guy um, out, out of a small Texas town uh, with about 800 kids at that where he was wow. a superintendent. Wow. And, um, and I thought, okay, well, I just need to go get that experience somewhere. And that's when I started applying outside of the San Antonio Austin area. And, you know, I'm a firm believer in the, the law of attraction. I'm the sure. firm believer in vision boards and absolutely. Um, putting it in God's hands. Mm-hmm. And so I actually created a fake news article naming me as loan finalist. It had my picture on it. It's <laughs> Dr. Chris Galloway named loan finalist. I didn't put a district name because I didn't know what to put. And right. then I literally listed my biography, where I'm from, what my experiences were, because I knew that would be in the newspaper article. And I cut that out and I put it on my mirror. And every morning when I brush my teeth after that moment in Floresville, um, you know, I, I, I looked at that article and it wasn't but three months later that I was named loan finalist in another district. Wow. That is yeah. so powerful. The power of manifestation. Wow. You manifested that. That's awesome. Really, really cool. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So like, I have to believe, though, there's some pros and cons in being a superintendent. What do you like most about being a superintendent and what's ugh, you like? Ugh. <laughs> well, I think the. For me, I, I'm a I'm an extrinsic extrinsic motivated person. I love to interact with people. I love talking to new people, new faces. So that part of the superintendency, you know, being the face of the community, being going to all these events and meeting people, I think that's the best part about being a superintendent. Um, I think having the the ability to enact change on such a, a, a huge macro level, uh, not only in my district, but superintendents are looked to at the state level to, sure. to testify at the legislative level and to talk to the commissioner and those type of things. Uh, so I think that having that ability to enact that change is important. Um, for example, we brought the four, four day week district. Um, we brought the four day week idea to our district this year after going to a conference and there's five districts in our area now that have gone to a 40 week for next school year, which okay. I think will benefit not only teachers, but kids as well. Sure. Um, so the power and in, in the there's a lot of responsibility that comes in that, but to enact that change on such a large level. So all in Northeast Texas eventually might go that route. Yeah. It, it's, it's tremendous. 
what I don't like so much about it, I think, is the the lack of privacy piece too. Sure. You know, it's the that piece where you are the face of the district and any wrong move, whether you know, or even positive or negative move, it's <laughs> gonna end up in the paper, most likely. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, it that that makes it hard. And I think that you know, a great example is talking about the, the power of, of making a decision is that that's also a negative too, because this year we had a, a couple bad weather days that came up and, you mm-hmm. know, I had to go out at 4.30 in the morning and ride around with other superintendents in the area. And we had to decide together if we're going to close school or not, because if one shuts down and the other one doesn't, then there's a lot of pressure from the community. Like, well, why did you shut down? You don't care about the safety of our kids because you stayed mm-hmm. open, those type of things. And, you know, I had heard coming into it, you know, that was one of the hardest decisions, deciding when to shut down school and when to keep it open, especially on a weather day. Um, You know, it's crazy. So when you make a decision like that, it it makes it difficult. And I had another incident that happened um, over Christmas break. We, We put a new turf on our football field. And when you put new turf on your football field, a lot of topsoil comes off of that field. And that's premium dirt. And we had it all put off to the side. And, you know, I was in line at Graceland with my kids and my wife and we were on Christmas break. And I got a call from a board member that said, hey, are we are we selling dirt? And I said, no. What what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, the dump trucks are delivering dirt all over Bowie County. And I said, I had no idea. So I called and come to find out the drivers for that company were taking gift cards to, to restaurants to deliver this dirt for free to the community members. And, you know, not that that's necessarily a negative thing. It's actually kind of a positive thing because we have taxpayers and, you know, we can give back, but there's a comp two companies in town that are landscaping companies. And they had about five or six jobs that were high paying jobs got canceled because of that. So now they view us as a district as trying to put them out of business, you know, wow. and, and you don't think about those repercussions. And I had sure. one more other incident that happened when I first got here. Um, there's a, there's a, a company that does like teledoc for schools okay. and, and it's free to kids. And so we, we can set that up to where kids can go to the nurse and if they have an ear infection, the nurse can, can check them out, but then get a doctor on teledoc and they had scopes that hooked up to the computer and they could check the ears and say, okay, it's an ear infection. You can just give the kid ibuprofen, get them back in class. So that way kids aren't missing school as much. Well, I, we have one doctor's office in town and mm. they viewed us as looking into that is, is trying to open a clinic in town to shut them down. And so, you know, we eventually couldn't go with that partnership because of the impact it would have on the one doctor's office in town. So, you know, it's those ramifications that sure. make it difficult as a superintendent. So you just have to think um, three, four steps ahead. So, you know, when you're when you're a superintendent, you're playing chess, you're not playing checkers. <laughs> That's that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Wow. Lots of unintended consequences, right? Yes, sir. Yep. Wow. That's and that's amazing when you consider that you just shared experiences that have happened in the first six months you've been a superintendent. Oh, and there's so much I can't share too. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Well, as you know, Dr. Galloway, this worldwide pandemic has impacted all of us, right? And so how would you say as superintendent that the um, pandemic has not only impacted you and your career, but also your family and your school system? Yeah, I think for every educator out there, I think the pandemic kind of changed our view of education. Um, You know, I think because families were able to come together and and make arrangements for their families to go remote for a certain period of time and, and those type of things. I mean, it, they, they, now there's families and, and companies learning they can work e- just as easy from home as they can from school. We yeah. do know that, you know, for our high school kids, you know, remote learning was pretty successful. But we also know for our elementary kids, it, it, you know, being in, in, in a classroom, able to learn how to read is, is essential. And Absolutely. so we know how that was strong, strongly impacted up here in, in the DCAB area. Um, you know, COVID wasn't as strenuous up here as it was in the bigger urban areas. Sure. So they came back to school a lot quicker. And I think we benefited from that because we saw that our, our elementary school is now a blue ribbon nominee and oh, they, wow. were, they, they were actually struggling before that, but they outperformed, you know, pretty much the state and, and reading and math improvements because they came back so early. So we knew that was crucial to, for, to help with that. Yeah. But also I think that, you know, our, our teachers have, have got, you know, PTSD from COVID in the sense of, you know, they're, they're a little bit, um, 
you know, a little bit more nervous about putting groups together. They're a little bit more nervous about one-on-one -on -one contact with kids. Um, they're getting a little bit better. Um, but I did see this not only in my former district, but a little bit in, in my rural district as well. And I think that the, the strain and stress uh, that was put on our families with COVID, losing family members and loved ones through that process as well. Um, and then what the state of Texas has put on pressure on them as well with the accountability things and measures that we need to do, it, it makes it more difficult for our teachers and, and educators as a whole. That's why we're seeing a large number of superintendent opens, opens, open, we're seeing a lot of superintendent openings in the right. state of Texas, as well as uh, administrators and teachers leaving. And there's a group in, in, in Texas called uh, Raise Your Hand Texas. And okay. They, they did a study and their study of, of um, the Rage Ran Texas is a group here in Texas. And they did a, a study where they uh, interviewed several teachers and 68% of educators that they interviewed said they were willing to leave the education field this year, like wow. quit teaching, not switch districts, quit teaching completely. And that's one of the reasons why we started looking at the four day week was to offer opportunities for our teachers to have a better work life balance. Sure. Um, we know that one in three teachers um, uh, works over a 60 hour week. Um, and we also know that teachers spend about an additional three hours above the normal school day on their work, whether it's lesson planning, grading papers, meeting with parents, whatever it might be, attending an activity that uh, students have at school, those type of things to support the campus and the students. So if we could give them an opportunity to do their, their paper grading, their collaboration, their ARD meetings and 504 meetings on Fridays, we feel like that would give them back their weekend so they can spend time with their families and kind of rebuild that relationship that, you know, it was really tested during COVID. So. Wow. That's really awesome um, that you guys are doing that and really just thinking outside the box on how to, you know, combat, like you said, this PTSD, you know, this burnout, fatigue, um, whatever adjective you want to use on how this um, pandemic has impacted, you know, our staffs. And I, honestly, it's not a phenomenon that's, you know, unique to Texas. It's going on here in Washington State. Yeah. And, you know, I have friends, I'm sure as you do, all across this country and world, actually, that it's happening everywhere. So it's definitely amazing, you know, what you guys are doing in your part of the world, you know, to just really kind of combat and, you know, just try to make it something that's manageable for our teachers. And I love that idea of a four day work week and helping, you know, just kind of improve that work life balance. So thank you for sharing that. Yes, sir. Wow. So we come to the end of our interview, but before I, um, you know, ask you my final question, um, I did want to um, ask you to just kind of share with someone that might be hearing you or watching you right now about their own life journey. If they wanted to get to where you are, it, it sounds like you did a lot of things um, in addition to your work experience to get where you are, one of them being actually getting a, a PhD. Can you kind of elaborate on what you feel were the most important things that you did to get where you are today? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing for me is relationship building okay. um, and able to, to, to break into the the club, so to speak, is of, of the assistant principal club, the principal club, um, you know, the, the superintendent club. It takes building relationships and networking. Sure. If, every time I go to a conference, I spend time getting to know people, collecting business cards, staying connected to people, um, as well as the districts I was in. I got to know the school board members because the school board members ultimately are the ones who approve contracts. Absolutely. So you want to make sure you get to know them as well. Um, and just building a portfolio. I have an electronic portfolio portfolio that you can see on LinkedIn. It's actually hasn't been changed since I got my superintendent job. So you okay. can kind of see how I built my portfolio on LinkedIn okay. um, to, to, to get to where I'm at now. It's an electronic portfolio. And, and that was very strategic so that when I was named loan finalist, I knew people would be Googling me and they did. And, and a lot of people in DCAP area got to know me before I even got up here and That's were excited amazing. about the things I had done. Um, as well as I think you, it's important to find a coach. Um, I, hmm. I've been coached by several people. In fact, I'm going into leadership coaching myself and awesome. happy to, 
to provide a, a free 30 minute session for any of um, the listeners out there that are looking to either break in into that administrative role or eventually want to become a superintendent. But I think that the most important thing is, is, is definitely, you know, whatever your God is, put faith into your God, let, let things go, um, have a vision board, have a plan. You don't have to have a plan to get there. You just have to know where you're trying to get to. Okay. It's not our job to find the path. The path will be opened up to you. Sure. Um, and then when, when you do see the signs of the path that you need to go and, and the route that you're being directed to, uh, jump in. You got to jump in with all feet first or with both feet first. And you need to to get out there and, and sometimes take a risk because without risk, there is no reward. And, you know, it's easy to sit back and say, well, I'll stay in this job for the next 15, 20 years and eventually mm-hmm. someone will come along. But I learned real quickly that everybody's replaceable. Every day <laughs> is a job interview. Yeah. And you definitely, you know, your loyalty can go only as far as the next person. And so, you know, as much as it's good to be loyal to the districts you're in and while you're there, but at some point you got to think about your future and what your future is for your family and you got to take a jump. So that's awesome. So let me get this straight. Network, network, network. Yes, sir. Get that experience and be willing to, you know, just kind of manifest what you want, you know, by vision boards, having a plan and just yeah. working toward that plan. Absolutely. And and get 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 in the coaching. Trust. In the coaching. Get a coach. And it doesn't have to be someone you're paying. It can be someone you trust, somebody who's already at where you need to go. Sure. But surround yourself with people that are doing what you want to do. Right. And if you don't, and if you don't know those people, listen to their podcasts, read their books, because eventually that'll, that'll pay off. I promise you. Well, we're definitely going to share your information um, with, you know, our viewers, because I might have to take you up on that coaching because I've learned a lot just during this interview. So thank you so much. Yes. So Dr. Galloway, I want to thank you for coming on the show, but before you leave, could you please give K-12 educators around the world some parting words of wisdom. Tell us how we can connect with you and then we'll say goodbye. Sure. Um, I think the the parting words of wisdom would be basically what I just said. Um, Seek out that that what inspires you understand what your why is and why you do what you do and understand why you want to get to where you want to get. Um, Simon Sinek, start with why that that's a huge Mm -hmm. piece for me. Um, I highly recommend that book, um, but definitely, you know, find a way, educate yourself and always work to grow because it will pay off. Um, and, and, and don't give up, don't give up and, and make sure you, you keep seeking what, what you're looking for and keep working towards it. And I'm, I'm on Twitter, um, at Dr. Chris Galloway. Uh, you can find my Twitter handle there. Um, as well as I'm on Facebook as well. My Facebook is, is actually open. Um, and I'm, I'll share the link with you, but if you, if you look on Facebook for Christopher with an OR at the end, um, Galloway, you should be able to find me and, and you can friend me as well. And you can see all the great things we're doing in our district and maybe some of that will inspire you as well. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on the show. And I I think we're going to have to reach out to you in about a year or so and just see how things are going with you. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you. All the best. Thank you for the time and good luck to everybody who's listening. Thank you.